Hello. First of all, thank you for the slides. Both are awesome. Um, I have one question. So, uh, Sam, you mentioned about the image decoder synchronous, which is, I think, is great. But it's also like sort of, um, so we decide which to go first, right? So the image will be deferred, and first we'll compile the JavaScript if you want to, vice versa, I think. But where does that falls into with the um, with the future of the web that Linz mentioned with uh, we can split both process, like one process takes out the image, the other process takes out the JavaScript, both can run prompt, I think at the same time if I'm getting this, uh, the, the topic correctly. So what do you take on that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, to be honest, I actually don't know if um, image decoding is easy to move off of the main thread. Um, we, so one of the things that we have done is WebAssembly. Um, you can actually uh, decode and compile WebAssembly off of the main thread. And we actually, um, tomorrow I have a blog post coming out about that. Uh, we just uh, finished our new compiler infrastructure that um, really makes, uh, takes advantage of that. We have um, basically, we go across all of your cores decoding and compiling, um, and we do a baseline version. And then um, we leave the main thread open to execute, and then do an optimizing compile in the background across all of your threads. Um, I, but I don't know about image decoding. Yeah, so my understanding, um, based on a very long thread with some Chrome engineers, is that, for the most part, this can be done asynchronously. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, edge cases that cause this to be synchronous. So that's the best answer that I've off the top of my head for you. <laughs> Hopefully, I think the goal is to move to a fully asynchronous world, so you don't really have to do this. But this provides um, the ability for a user to opt in. And I think this is what Safari does by default, always, anyways. So more control. Thank you. Um, this is uh, probably more for uh, Lynn. Uh, Jen, uh, sorry. The, um, the question is about um, WebAssembly. And is that something that is going to be embraced by all vendors, like Chrome, Edge, oh, et cetera, already, Safari? Uh, uh, I should have mentioned that. It already is in all browsers. Ooh, OK. Yeah. Um, that's my question. <laughs> so I have a question on web workers. Um, I had a particular use case a couple months ago where I had a very multi-layered SVG that created this really cool glowing paper. Um, and I would always run it at the end of my page to apply to you know a piece of paper to make it look really cool. And because the SVG was so complex, I couldn't actually use it on the paper because just typing a character would take like you know uh, t two tenths of a second or something like that because the the SVG complication was so intense. So instead, I like live decoded it to a PNG on a canvas and then saved that canvas to a data URL and then set the background to that data URL and it worked. Yep. It like totally worked, but that computation is expensive and one thing I couldn't figure out how to do on a web worker is how can you just have, can a web worker have its own canvas that it can paint to and then can it you know do all that save PNG on that canvas and then ship that file, then that would be I could do that asynchronously and have this effect all over the place. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, is that possible? Or how do I do something like that? Uh, so if you go into Google and you type uh, MDN space off-screen canvas, it's the first result. It is a thing that now exists. Is it like new? Yeah. OK. It was part of this talk, and I removed it. But I should have put it in. Well, <laughs> thank you. No problem. <laughs> Hi, a question for both of you. Uh, I think both of you have talked about some really interesting ways of sort of raising the ceiling of how great browsers can be. Uh, but my question is sort of how do you approach raising the floor of how, um, how browsers can be like, uh, m like about enterprises who are still using IE or um, a certain modern browser that doesn't support service workers for some reason? Um, how do you go about like ensuring that the cool stuff that you're shipping can be used and be used by everyone? So. For us, uh, I, I work a lot with the WebAssembly team, um, and polyfills are a huge thing for us. Um, so we are trying to figure out how to 
have WebAssembly have direct access to DOM objects, basically, where you can call methods on the DOM objects straight from WebAssembly. You don't, that way you don't have to go through JavaScript, which slows things down. Um, we have a proposal in the WebAssembly um, working group that makes it really easy to um, have a polyfillable version of that direct DOM access. So for now, it will be, you know, um, whoever implement, you know, say we have it first in Firefox, it would go a little bit faster in Firefox, but um, you could still use JavaScript to do it and you'd have the same API. You, you'd be working with the same API, uh, which is the important part. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think shipping polyfills, usually these new features will come out with a polyfill, otherwise it's sort of hard to sell because trying to get multiple browsers to implement at the same time is difficult slash impossible in some mm -hmm. cases. Um, and I mean, as a user, as an end developer, I would encust myself being an end developer. Uh, I find myself reaching out to these browser vendors via Twitter or other social media outlets and being like, oh, it'd be cool if this would work. Uh, here's my demo. Uh, let me know what I can do to help. And usually they're super receptive. They do listen. So that's my recommendation. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Sam, you mentioned uh, shared memory browsers um, can be described as uh, shared memory that can be uh, mutated. And you said that some developers would be very scared of that. Um, what are some of the downsides of shared memory buffers? Um, the big one, I think, is when you have shared memory, you run into locking conditions and data propagation issues. So if you change uh, a value to two, Everybody doesn't know it's two. So uh, using Lynn's example of a plus plus, you can get different operations with a plus plus operator uh, if you don't respect locking. So. Mm -hmm. so you just have to be more careful, it sounds like. Well, so unless you use something called atomics, you can't actually get around that problem at all. There's just like no way unless you, you actually um, do use a, a locking mechanism. Um, and those can actually slow you down they could actually potentially make your code slower than it would have been otherwise. So um, it's not a silver bullet, basically. Yeah, the, the atomics page on uh, the docs, the MDN docs, are, it's pretty intense. It took me a lot of read-throughs to grasp what was going on, but uh, it's just trickier to work with, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this is a question for both of you. Um, Sam, you mentioned that um, we can skip the download phase of a lot of files just by using the cache, uh, but there's this kind of unavoidable uh, parse and compile step. Does WebAssembly in any way help us get around that just by shipping something that's already interpreted? So, uh, so this is, it's funny you should ask this because I just wrote about this in the post, post that's going up tomorrow. Um, we can actually cache the fully optimized co uh, compiled version of WebAssembly. We haven't yet done that in Firefox, but um, we have what's called the JavaScript bytecode cache. We can just reuse that uh, to have the fully optimized version of the compiled code. And then you get rid of all of that decode and compile time. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so if you look at, um, uh, there's a node package called V8. Code cache, I think. So in Node, you can actually cache your uh, snapshots. So it can speed up load time. So if you look at uh, Yarn or the new bundle thing, or bundle tool called Pars Parcel, they both use this, and that's mm -hmm. what makes their code super fast. So Wasm is definitely a totally fast path for that. <laughs> Hi. So as far as, the, as far as I understand, web workers is the way to uh, to utilize multi-core architecture. In that way, you can improve performance because if it's a single-thread JavaScript which uses the reactive pattern, you pretty much expect that everything is executed as sync, but web workers are the way to take advantage of the multi-core ar architecture. Is that the point? I would say, yeah, I mean, that is, I would agree with that. Um, I don't think that you can have application code that works across multiple cores without using web workers, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, I'm not sure. In the Chrome world, it's broken out by process. Um, so I'm not sure how it breaks up the actual core allocation. Mm -hmm. But 
it allows you to, and a high level workers allow you to parallelize your yeah. code across processes. I see. And the other question, uh, what is the advantage of using shared memory over the channels uh, in order to synchronize web workers like GoLan is using channels and Go routines and it works pretty well for it? So I, um, I'm a little bit familiar with Go routines because of Rust. Um, I don't know. Uh, they have been kind of emulating Go routines. Um, so my understanding is that uh, basically Go routines, you have, instead of allowing the operating systems to schedule things, you have the uh, Go actually scheduling the things for you. Um, and... Yeah, well, channels is the way how you can uh, synchronize workers without sharing memory. When you create channel, okay. and then every worker will listen right. to the channel. So, um, there are some times where you wouldn't actually want to use a shared memory, um, where basically using a post message approach um, in JavaScript would be optimal. Um, in fact, a lot of cases that is the case. Um, but there are like certain cases where uh, shared memory is faster. And, and I think that it's really, you have to look at the case by case basis. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, um, HTTP2 gives us the promise of getting rid of bundling, um, which as a developer, I would be very happy to remove that from my build step. Um, but the thing that it doesn't fix is the minification step, which gzip is still like not good enough to fix that. Are, are there any standards or any kind of ideas coming in that direction where we finally can just ship the actual files? Yes, <laughs> there are. Um, <laughs> uh, the one that jumps out to me uh, is uh, shared compression dictionaries, I think, which is a Bratly thing. So it means that your server or your uh, whatever your proxy layer is at the end, Cloudflare or whatever, will look at the assets that you're delivering and will compress them and take, uh, so I read a white paper about this and learned all about compression dictionaries, TIL. Um, basically it takes the words that it uses uh, for compression and it looks at what words it has already used for one bundle and then ships a custom, in, custom minification dictionary to the client, which enables it to decode things better and um, compress things better. So the space is being looked at, shared compression dictionaries. I think there's a mailing list for it and everything. Um, that's what I know, Lynn. <laughs> I actually don't know too much about this topic, so. Okay. When, when can I have it? <laughs> <laughs> Just ask that on the mailing list. You'll get great responses. <laughs> Thanks. Um, for Sam, this is... Um, I haven't used HTTP to push because in addition to having to deal with the browser's cache, I'm working with service workers. Is there a way to avoid collision between what gets pushed and what's already on the service worker, not just the, the browser cache? Yeah, you, you find yourself in the very special place, the very difficult place that I like to avoid. But um, Me too. <laughs> Um, my understanding is that with servers like H2O, with, I think it's H2.0, um, which is a Go implementation of the HTTP2 server, it has this Bloom filter that it uses to know what, and a, oh, a, cook, wait, a, a cookie that it sends to the server that it uses a Bloom filter on to determine what is already delivered. And I think you can configure that to work and tell it uh, to persist assets. It gets kind of complicated really quick. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> Thank you.